Good afternoon. So in today's lecture, which will take a little bit longer probably, I want to go over uh, two more examples with the separation of variables, this time involving the heat equation. Um, there will be more examples. So the, the following, this one and the next, um, the following one, maybe the next two lectures will be just uh, going through uh, various examples. And, uh, you know, similar to the homework problems, but the idea is to practice with the separation of variables as much as possible. It's very important to understand that at some point, some of the steps will be skipped, will be taken for granted. Um, if you want to check yourself that you understood the concept, you could basically fill in the missing steps um, because they are similar or maybe they are identical to other problems. So uh, let's do, like I said, a heat equation, and I'm going to have this heat equation uh, with a not specified um, um, parameter A, the, um, the conduction term, right? So ut equals A squared ux twice. And uh, let's say we have basically a rod of length 6. So x is between 0 and 6, because I want to have basically also an example in which we need to adjust the interval. Uh, let's see. Well, let's say actually 5. Let's do 5. Doesn't, make, doesn't matter actually, but yeah, doesn't matter. Right, so let's say the, the length of the rod is 5. Okay, and Dirichlet condition means that when you have specified values at the boundary points, and of course, in this case, we still deal with the homogeneous conditions. So let's say the initial temperature distribution, u of x zero, uh, let's choose also x at this point because it gives me eventually the, you know, the easiest uh, uh, series to deal with in the table. So u of x zero equals x. And the boundary conditions u of 0t equals u of pi, uh, excuse me, 5t equals 0. So these are the so called Dirichlet condition. <clears throat> All right. So just like before, we take the product form u of x t is a product of a function in little x and a function in little t. And then we plug it into the PDE. So we have u partial t, which is big X t prime equals a squared x double prime big T. And let's separate. Uh, we divide by big T and by big x and that gives me uh by the way a squared doesn't matter where you uh, put it it's practical as a rule of thumb to keep the uh, anticipated eigenvalue problem as clean as possible because it's easier to recognize it as one of those done before. So I'm already anticipating here that big X will be my Sturm-Leville problem. I can already see it, X double prime X and lambda. So I'm gonna move the constant A squared on the left side as well. So therefore, after I separate this, this becomes T prime over A squared big T. And then this is equal to X double prime over big X. And now I introduce the separation constant lambda. This is a separated form. Let's impose the uh, sep uh, product form into the boundary conditions. So u of zero t is x of zero, big T of t equals x of five, big T of t equals zero. For that to happen for any t, we have x of zero equals x of five equals zero. Okay. So the Sturm-Leuven problem or the eigenvalue problem is going to be the big X problem, the, the ODE in terms of big X, because that's the one that 
is attached to homogeneous boundary conditions. So that's the one that becomes a homogeneous boundary value problem. So the Solovin problem therefore is x double prime plus lambda x equals zero, x of zero equals x of five equals zero. So I'm gonna do fewer steps than before on this one. Check for yourself that the case lambda less than zero, lambda equal to zero lead to zero solution. So those will be disregarded. It's very similar as the case zero pi. So in the two lectures ago, we had a, the same ODE with the boundary conditions x of zero, x of pi equals zero. The whole mechanics are the same. If you choose, if, if you have uh, those three cases for the solution of big X, lambda uh, less than zero, lambda equals zero leads to zero solution, which we don't take into account. We're looking for non-zero solutions. So when you look at the characteristic equation for this um, um, uh, ODE, we're looking just at lambda greater than zero. And you might remember from the previous, I mean, we can keep this notation because sometimes, like I said before, it's practical sometimes to denote lambda if it's positive by minus, um, excuse me, by, by a squared, or you can't use a now because we have it already in the problem, but something to the power two. You don't have to do that. You can still work with square root of lambda. Just be aware that you are in the complex root case. Make sure you don't make a mistake here and think you are in the real case. So if lambda is greater than zero, when you solve for r, that's plus minus square root of minus lambda, which is plus minus i root lambda. And so therefore your solution at this point is some constant cosine of root lambda x, x is outside of the square root, plus some other constant sine of square root of lambda x. Very similar to the zero pi case. So let's impose the boundary conditions. Look carefully. So when I do x of zero equals zero, that gives me c1 cosine of zero plus c2 sine of zero equals zero. Sine of zero is zero, cosine of zero is one. So therefore this condition gives me c1 equals zero. And at this point, when you move on to the second boundary condition, you can just cut the first piece because you already show that c1 is zero. So now we're looking at x of pi equals zero, uh, not x of pi, I'm sorry, x of five equals zero. And so that means c2 sine of square root of lambda x equals zero. Pay close attention here. This is the moment when we find, when we find the uh, eigenvalues. Sine of what is equal to zero? Again, if, it's, if it doesn't uh, click already, you can look at the unit circle. All multiples of pi will give you sine equals zero. Zero, pi, two pi, three pi, and so on. All right, so with the, from uh, not zero, because so pi, two pi, three pi, and so on. Remember, we're looking for non-zero solutions. So that means uh, the inside of sine Right, so sine of a multiple of pi is equal to zero. So the inside of that sine, lambda times square root of lambda times x, should be a multiple of pi, n pi with n from one, two, three, and so on. So let's continue on this panel here. So that means um, uh, not not x. I'm sorry, because it's five. Right, we plugged in five for x. Sorry about that. So you have sine of square root of lambda times five equal to zero, which means root lambda times five equals n pi. That gives me square root of lambda equals n pi over five. And that means lambda, if I square both sides, and at this point I might as well call it lambda n, is n pi over five to the power two, right? Where n is one, two, three, and so on. <clears throat> So we found our eigenvalues and of course the corresponding eigenfunctions. The eigenfunctions is essentially the solution, the big X, look at this, disregarding the constant because the constant will be assembled later when we did this, we do the superposition. So Xn of X, the solution you can call it Xn as well, will be 
sine of square root of lambda n, which is n pi over 5, times x. So these are the eigenvalues, these are the eigenfunctions. <clears throat> you might already see that this may lead, lead to a series uh, representation in the interval 0, 5, a, seri a sign series, but let's, let's uh, not rush the whole thing. All right, we're done with the Sturmlevin problem. Now, for each lambda, we move to do the, uh, you know, to solve the um, initial value problem, the one in big T. So that is T prime over A squared T equals minus lambda, which, again, that's minus lambda N, really. And that's minus N pi over 5 to the power 2. Uh, let's multiply by a squared t on both sides to eliminate the denominator. So t prime equals minus n pi over 5 squared, a squared big T. And just to make it more streamlined, I'm going to put this into a single square. t prime equals minus n pi a over 5 quantity squared times t. <clears throat> This is actually straightforward. This is essentially an exponential ODE. I'm going to write here in the corner just a refresher. Remember from um, ODE class, dy dt equals some constant times y. That means y is c equal uh, e to the kt, right? So just a constant e to the kt. The only difference is that that constant k here is given by this, um, this big... Um, mass here, n pi a over 5 quantity squared. But the solution, big T of little t, and again, to pay attention here, I might as well call it Tn of t, because we have one for each n, the solution is Tn of t. It's a constant, which I might again call it a n, because again, it's one for every little n, um, e to the power minus n pi a over 5 squared little t. So it's an exponential in little t. <clears throat> so at this point, we're ex actually quite closer to the finish line. All we have to do now is to use the superposition principle. And write a linear combination of the solutions we found. Remember, we found infinitely many solutions. Uh, let's not forget where we started from. We assume the solution has this product form. And as a matter of fact, we obtain infinitely many of them. Xn of x, Tn of t. To be more precise, x n of x, which was which is sine of n pi x over five, and t n, which is a n e to the minus n pi. Uh, let me see if I can squeeze it here. Five squared, um, and oops, t here doesn't look good. I'm going to move on to the second page, obviously, to make it uh, where I have more room here to to write the, this summation. So we have infinitely many uh, solutions of the PDE for now. And importantly, all satisfying all conditions up until this point, except look on the left corner all the way back to the initial condition. So for now, if it wasn't for that initial condition, that non-homogeneous initial condition, all of these will satisfy all other conditions, right? If you plug in zero for X, um, you're going to get um, zero, right? Sine of zero is zero. If you plug in five um, for x, you'll also get zero, right? So the boundary conditions are satisfied. But because we need to also satisfy the initial condition, we need to take a, a series representation of that initial condition. So those constants to, to be determined are a n, will, will be determined when we impose that initial condition. So let's uh, move on to the next page to finalize this. All right, so let's write down the superposition principle. 
It just occurs to me that there is actually a dog um, that I hear from the outside. I hope it doesn't make it too disturbing somewhere outside where I am. So the superposition means that we take a solution of the format a series of all the solutions we found already. Like I said before, that's a n um, sine of n pi x over 5 and then e to the power minus n pi a over 5 and then t. All right, so <clears throat> finally, we look at the initial conditions that is yet to be fit to the solution. So we have that u of x 0 should be equal to x. Remember on the interval 0, 5. Now, u of x 0, if we look at the solution uh, in our format, remember sine of, uh, uh, if, if I plug in 0 for t, so let's actually do it like that just to be clear where it comes from. So u of x 0 is a n, summation of a n, sine of n pi x over 5, e to the minus n pi a over 5 times 0, right, because we plug in 0. This should be equal to x. Now e to the 0 is 1, so that means we need essentially a n, we need to find a n such that the summation from 1 to infinity a n sine of n pi x over 5 is equal to x. That is another way of asking what is the Fourier sine series for x on the interval 0, 5. I look at the table, so in the table that I use, um, I can see the Fourier sine series for x on the interval 0, pi. So on the interval 0, pi, pay attention here as well because you may need to do these adjustments of intervals always, right? If, if the problem requires you to do that. So on the interval 0 pi, we know that x is 2 summation from 1 to infinity minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n sine of nx. But my x is between, uh, is between 0 and 5. For me to use this series, I need to change the interval. So I need to <clears throat> divide by 5 um, and multiply by, five, by pi. And then I can plug in pi x over 5 into this series and then get x by itself after that. So this becomes pi x over 5 equals 2 summation from 1 to infinity minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n sine of n pi x over 5. Move pi over 5 to the right and that means x is equal to 5 over pi times 2 times the summation from 1 to infinity minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n sine of n pi x over 5. All right, so <clears throat> if you bring the constant inside here just to see it clearly, that's going to be 10 minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n pi sine of n pi x over 5. All right, so we got x as a Fourier series, uh, sine series on interval 0, 5, which needs to be fit with a n, summation of a n sine of n pi x over 5. So if it's not clear, a n is just the coefficient over here, right? So again, let's write it down one more time, just if it's not clear. You don't have to do this. Once you get uh, the idea and you figure out what a n is, just write it down and be done with it. So this is what the problem leads to. So the problem leads to, and the right hand side is what I got from the table or from that manipulation, right, with the, with the interval. So on the right hand side, we know that um, x should be, is equal to this series um, as a Fourier sign series on that interval. So obviously a n, is going to be 10 minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n pi. At this point, you can finalize it like that. I mean, like you can finish it here. Um, we can claim victory once we find this constant. But if you want to really write the full solution, um, 
then the full solution of the boundary value problem, just plug in back an that you just found, right? Is an, which is 10 minus one to the n plus one over n pi. Then we have sine of n pi x over five and the other component that depends on t. This was a square here, it's a typo here, sorry. So minus n pi a over five uh, quantity squared and then little t. All right, so this is the Dirichlet problem for the heat equation. Uh, at this point, if you don't have the energy to it, we ca you can do it in another uh, sitting, but I'll continue and do the um, Newman condition problem in which the conditions on the endpoints are in terms of the temperature gradients. So the meaning will be insulated ends for the same object. So stay tuned for the second part. All right, so this one is an object with insulated ends. That means the flow is zero at the end points. This leads to the Newman conditions. And we're gonna make some changes here as well in the initial condition, just to add some variety. So the heat equation would be, let's write it here, is gonna be ut equals a squared ux twice. And let's take the initial condition, u of x zero equals x squared, just to, just to use a different function for variety. And the insulated ends means that the uh, homogeneous condition, the homogeneous boundary conditions are in terms of the boundary, the uh, temperature gradient. So u partial x at zero t equals u partial x at uh, five t equals zero. So these will be Newman conditions. Right, because they are expressed in terms of uh, derivatives, partial derivatives at the uh, boundary points. The Stirlerville problem, I'll do it in more details because you'll see this is going to be different than in the previous case, because the boundary conditions are different. Uh, and let's, we already know it's separable, right? So we start as always with assuming the product form. And this part is the same. So on the left side, we have x t prime equals a squared x double prime big T. Uh, separate um, t prime over a squared big T equals um, x double prime over big X equals minus lambda. So the OD itself for the Sturmovilm problem is the same, but the boundary conditions are different because Let's see uh, how the boundary conditions look like when I impose the product form. So u partial x is gonna be x prime of little x. So evaluated at zero, that's gonna be x prime of zero, big T of little t equals x prime of five, big T of little t equals zero. Again, because we're looking for non-zero solutions, uh, this means x prime of zero should be equal to x prime of five uh, equal to zero. All right, so with that in mind, the sturm levin problem, or remember you can call it the eigenvalue problem if you don't like to call it by the names of the guys. So the eigenvalue problem is x double prime plus lambda x equal to zero with the boundary conditions x prime of zero equals x prime of five equal to zero. So let's go through all cases this time to see what we get, because you will see there's a difference there. As always, we look at the characteristic equation and we have three cases for lambda. Let's, what, let's see what happens if lambda is less than zero. If lambda is less than zero, again, just for uh, simplicity, let's call it minus alpha squared. I, I have to call it alpha because A is already taken. Uh, just for simplicity, remember. So if it's minus alpha squared, that means the characteristic equation gives me the roots plus minus alpha. So this is the real case in which case the solution, so we're in case lambda less than zero. So the solution is going to be a combination of exponentials, c1 e to the alpha x 
plus c2 e to the minus alpha x. Now let's solve the boundary real problem. We have to differentiate big X because we have to plug in zero and five into the derivatives. So this will be alpha C1 e to the alpha X minus alpha C2 e to the minus alpha X. Now X prime of zero ends up being alpha C1 minus alpha C2 equal to zero. So if I pull out alpha, I'm going to end up with C1 equals C2 from the first condition. <clears throat> okay, now let's impose the second condition, x prime of uh, 5 equal to 0. Now, because C1 is equal to C2, you can call both of them equal to C. So that means if I go back to x prime of x, and plug in 5, what I get there is alpha c e to the 5x minus alpha c e to the minus 5x, which should be 0 as well. Now, notice here that I can pull out alpha c. Um, not, not 5x, I'm sorry, just e to the 5. e to the 5 minus e to the minus 5, because x is 5. So if I pull out alpha c, e to the 5 minus e to the minus 5, these guys are different. So this is not going to be equal to 0. One second. A uh, little bit of typo here. Got myself confused. It's not x, but it's alpha. So x prime of 5 is alpha c e to the 5 alpha. Um, yeah, and then e to the minus 5 alpha over here. Alpha, alpha. But either way, these are not equal to 0 because alpha is not equal to 0. So this parenthesis is not equal to 0. e to the 5 alpha minus e to the minus 5 alpha, yes. So that parenthesis is not equal to 0. And that means for the product to be equal to zero, you must have C equal to zero. So the point to be made here is that in this case, uh, when you have um, a negative lambda, you have just the trivial solution. So just the zero solution. So you don't have an eigenvalue basically in the case lambda is less than zero, just like in the Dirichlet problem. In when lambda was zero, uh, less than zero uh, for Dirichlet conditions, um, you didn't have a non-zero solution for, for the boundary value problem. Okay, but now pay attention to the second case, which in the previous case, in the Dirichlet case, also led to um, non-zero, to zero solutions. That won't be the case here. So let's see what happens if lambda is less, is equal to zero. If lambda is equal to zero, then the um, OD is simply x double prime equal to zero. Uh, and if you integrate it twice, remember that gives you a linear solution. So C1 X plus C2. Now we have to plug in the boundary conditions into the derivative. So X prime of X is just C1. So X prime of zero should be equal to zero. X prime of uh, five should be equal to zero, but both of them simply give you C1 equals zero because X prime is just a constant for any X. So both of the boundary conditions just give you C1 equal to zero. But at this point, notice that C2 is arbitrary. So you do have an eigenfunction here. You do have a non-zero solution. It's just any constant. So any constant is a solution. And because we're going to assemble the arbitrary constants later when we do the superposition principle, you can simply take that constant to be one just for practical purposes, because we're going to have a linear combinations of these solutions later. So we're going to have those arbitrary constants coming up later when we uh, impose the initial condition. So the point to be made is that in this case, in the Newman conditions, lambda equals zero is an eigenvalue. I'm going to index this lambda by zero because then 
n will be 1, 2, 3 in the other cases. And the eigenfunction is simply equal to 1. So we have already a pair of uh, one eigenvalue and one eigenfunction. 0 and 1. So lambda 0, for corresponding to lambda 0, big X is just a constant and we take it for convenience to be 1. And we index this by 0 uh, because later on it will depend on n from 1, 2, 3 and so on. So that is the ma main difference between the previous case. Because in the previous case, again, lambda equals 0 gave us uh, a trivial solution. So let's move on with what happens if lambda is positive. And I think, let's see, um, let's, let's also use that convention with alpha. We, we can keep lambda, but then you'll use the square root of lambda. Again, for convenience, you can always replace positive constants by something to the power 2 or negative constants by minus alpha square, like I did it in the first case. So if lambda equals, if lambda is a positive number, then the characteristic equation becomes r square plus alpha square equals zero. r is plus minus um, alpha i, imaginary unit, and big X becomes the combination of cosine of alpha X plus sine of alpha X. So C2 sine of uh, alpha X, sorry, let me write it one more time. C1 cosine of alpha x, C2 sine of alpha x. <clears throat> All right. Uh, we need to differentiate it again. So we can apply boundary conditions. So x prime is going to be minus alpha C1 sine of alpha x plus alpha C2 cosine of alpha x we need to plug in the boundary conditions into the derivative of x. And again, try to remember what happened in the previous case, just to compare. So x prime of zero should be zero. X prime of zero is minus alpha C1 sine of zero plus alpha C2 cosine of zero, which should be zero. Once again, cosine of zero is one, sine of zero is equal to zero. So, in this case, I get that C2 times 1 equals 0, uh, which means C2 is equal to 0, obviously. So C2 is 0. And notice the major difference here. If C2 is equal to 0, that means the sine disappears. So you're left with the cosines. That's the, uh, the difference, which means this will lead to Fourier cosine series. You realize that we didn't learn those for nothing, right? So in the previous case, we had Fourier sine series. Here, the sturm levin problem leads to eigenfunctions in the form of cosine series. C2 is zero. And uh, let's impose now, finally, the last boundary condition here. So x prime of five should be zero. Now I can ignore the C2 sine of alpha x because C2 is already determined to be zero. So I get C1 cosine of alpha times five should be zero. <clears throat> uh, no, sorry, because <laughs> I have to plug in into x prime. So like I said, C2 is equal to zero, so I can get rid of uh, this piece here. So x prime of five is minus alpha C1 sine of alpha times five equal to zero. Uh, these are non-zero. I have to assume C1 is not equal to zero because otherwise I get trivial solutions. So that means sine of alpha or five alpha should be zero. And that means five alpha should be a multiple of pi with n from one, two, three, and so on. That means alpha is equal to n pi over five. And the eigenvalue was alpha squared, which means the eigenvalues are n pi over 5 to the power 2, alpha squared, and the corresponding eigenfunctions will be uh, the one in terms of cosine, because C1 is not equal to 0, right? So it will be cosine of alpha, which is n pi over 5, times x. So, major difference between the previous case, between the Dirichlet case, Zero is an eigenvalue, one is an eigenfunction corresponding to it. 
the other eigenvalues are the same, I, n pi over 5 to the power 2, eigenfunctions are now cosines instead of sine. So let's finish this on the second page, on the next page. All right, so let's see what we obtain already. Eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Lambda 0, x1, and then lambda n, n pi over 5 squared, um, and then xn of little x, cosine of n pi uh, x over 5, with n from 1, 2, 3, and so on. So when we move on to the... Um, to the equation in t, so remember now we have to solve t prime, the other equation, right? So t prime over t over a squared t equals minus lambda, which is really t prime equals minus lambda a squared t. Remember we have to solve this for each lambda, for each eigenvalue. So now you have to basically to take two separate cases because again you have this um, eigenvalue and eigenfunction uh, separated from the rest of the the pack, so to speak. So we're going to do the one corresponding to lambda zero. So that means I go to the equation in T and of course I plug in zero for lambda and that's just T prime equals zero. Now T prime equals zero is a constant. I mean, if T prime equals zero, that means T uh, is a constant. Label this T or index this T as sub zero, just to make it an agreement with the index of lambda in this case. So t naught of little t should be a constant, just call it a naught. All right, so that is um, big T corresponding to uh, lambda z uh, zero and x equal to one. That's basically one pair of the solution, uh, big X and big T. Remember, we came from uh, u of xt having the product form. So basically x naught of uh, little x, t naught of little t, which is essentially one times a naught, is one of those solutions that we're gonna assemble later into a series when we, when we do the superposition principle. And now it's kind of similar to the previous step. We plug in lambda n so now we solve corresponding to lambda n equals n pi over 5 squared and xn cosine of n pi x over 5. The equation is now minus lambda n, which is n pi over 5 squared a squared big T. This is similar to the previous step. Call the solution Tn of little t, which is a constant times an exponential minus n pi a over 5 squared t. Okay, when we do superposition, we have, remember, like I said, the first pair, 1 times a naught plus summation of the rest of them from 1 to infinity. Uh, a n cosine of n pi x over 5 e to the minus n pi a over 5 squared t. So basically this is going to be your solution in the end. The only thing left to do is to find those constants. And the only thing left to impose as a condition on the solution is the initial condition. So remember if you turn the page, the initial condition was y of x naught equal x squared. But y of x naught, if we use this series, is going to be a naught plus the summation from 1 to infinity a n cosine of n pi x over 5 e to the 0, which is 1. And this should be equal to x squared. To find these coefficients is to say that I need to find the Fourier cosine series for x squared on the interval 0, 5. So in the table I gave you the series for x squared, the Fourier cosine series, is given on the interval 0, c. So you have c, x squared equals c squared over 3 
plus the summation from, uh, not summation, not yet, for c squared over pi squared. Summation from one to infinity minus one to the, um, minus one to the n over n squared cosine of n pi x over phi. Let me double check. All right. So we simply, uh, n pi x over c actually. So we simply replace c with phi because that's what we need in our problem. So we take the combination that gives me the solution that came from the, from the solution and then replace x squared with the series from the table, which again, if I replace c with five, that gives me 25 over three plus uh, four times 25, that's 100 over pi squared. Cosine of n pi x over five. <clears throat> so now you simply match the coefficients left and right. A naught will be 25 over three. A n will be this guy. Don't forget to include also the coefficient on the outside of the summation. So A n would be 100 over pi squared minus one to the n over n squared. All right, so when everything is said and done, um, if you want, we can stop here, but if you want, you can just write the full solution now by plugging in the coefficients back into the, uh, back into the full solution here when I took the superposition of those um, functions. So my solution would be a naught, one times a naught, which is simply 25 over three, plus the summation from one to infinity, the constant we just determined, 100 over pi squared minus one to the n over n squared, um, cosine, and then the portion in terms of t. All right. So as I said, as we move along, we will focus primarily on the parts of these problems that are different. And sometimes we will just use the, like I said, the, the, the key thing is where we save a lot of time from now on, will be uh, taking for granted the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions if we recognize the Sturm-Levin problem as being already solved. Nevertheless, make sure you know how to actually solve it from top to finish if uh, you are asked to do, or if the problem leads to uh, one of these uh, Sturm-Levin problems not given already in, in some table of some sort. So I think that's it for today.